In this video, we'll be covering all the basics of vias in PCB design. We'll go through four main topics. First of all, the basics of vias, their parameters, for instance, pad sizes, drill sizes, and my recommendations, current handling, and so on. Guidelines and tips for proper placement in your PCB designs to minimize inductance, improve assembly performance, and avoid something known as voiding. Then we'll look at transfer vias, which are very important when we're switching reference layers, and finally, we'll look at stitching vias, which are typically used for shielding purposes, but also to tie reference planes together. Throughout this video, I'll keep coming back to this board, which is an audio digital signal processing board, and I've used many of these tips and guidelines with regards to vias when designing this PCB. Thank you very much to Altium for sponsoring this video. If you'd like to give Altium Designer a try for yourself, make sure to check out the link in the description below, or go to altium.com forward slash yt forward slash Phil's lab to get yourself an Altium Designer free trial. Let's start off with VIA basics. If you're already familiar with VIAs, don't worry, we'll go into more depth later on. We all know traces are connections on a plane. So on a layer, we can route anywhere on that plane, and that's usually called a trace, or we can use things such as copper pores. However, once we want to route between layers, for example, connecting layer one to layer three, we need to use something that's called a VIA. Essentially, it's just a vertical connection in the third dimension. This is used for connections between layers. So our trace on one layer can jump to any or multiple layers in a PCB. We don't just have to end up on one layer. If we're not connecting to a certain layer with a VIA, we will create a void on that layer, and we'll look at that in more detail later on. A void you can see on the image on the right here, where we have essentially an anti-pad in the layer we are passing through. You can think of a VIA as essentially a tiny plated through hole. When we're talking about VIAs, we have certain main parameters. We can see a typical VIA drawn on the right image here. We have a pad size denoted by P, which is the overall diameter of the VIA. Then we also have a drill size, which has to always be smaller than the pad size, and we'll denote this by D. The drill size is limited by the aspect ratio, so this is a manufacturing problem, and depends on your board thickness. So the thicker your board is, in general, you'll need a larger drill size. If we subtract the diameter from our pad size P and divide that number by two, we get the size of the annular ring. Both the drill size and the annular ring size are important manufacturing parameters. If you look at a typical PCB manufacturer's website, you'll have capabilities sections. This could be, for example, the drill sizes. So for example, this manufacturer can go down to 0.2 millimeters for their standard PCBs, and will also tell you the minimum widths, for example, of the annular rings. It's important that we typically stay away from minimums when it comes to PCB manufacturing anyway. PCB manufacturers will also offer more advanced capabilities in certain areas. For example, here we can get a three mil, which happens to be less than 0.1 of a millimeter annular ring. But then again, you have to pay extra for that. So that's something you have to keep in mind when sizing your vias. Other than drill sizes, pad sizes, and annular rings, there are also many other parameters that make up a via. For example, tenting, which is covering the via with a solder mask, and this is no extra cost typically, filling the via, which will be an extra cost, and then we have different types. I'll just be talking about through vias in this example, so running from top of the PCB to the bottom of the PCB, but you have to be aware that there's also blind, buried, and micro vias, which are topics for future videos. In Altium Designer, let me show you the basic via parameters, how to change them, and then also looking at tenting vias. I press 2 to get to my 2D view and just zoom in. I can zoom in, for example, this via here. If I click on it, on the right panel, I can see my diameter, which is my pad size, and my hole size as well. And these are the main defining parameters of this via, and this is a simple through-hole via. I could, for example, change the diameter to make it larger, so that increases my pad size and thus also increases my annular ring with the same hole size, and I could also increase my hole size or my drill size. We'll look at how to choose via sizes in just a second. You can also see this solder mask color is blue and it's covering all of these vias. And this is known as tenting. It can be useful to not tent vias in case you want to turn them into test points. And typically test points you put at the bottom of a PCB. So if I choose this via and want to make it into a test point just with tenting, I can go to the via types on the right side and click type 1A tenting. This way tenting is only on the top side. So it's this via here. If I switch to the bottom view, you can see we have now removed solder mask around this via, and this is incredibly helpful for a bed of nails type testing environment. It's difficult to give general via diameters and parameters you should always use. 
It really depends on the scenario, your need. If you're, for example, routing out a very fine pitch BGA, your VIA needs will be completely different to routing out an audio through-hole board, for example. We have to take some things into account though. A small drill size, for example, something like 0.15 millimeters or anything less than 0.2 millimeters, will typically give an increased PCB cost and a lower yield. Lower yield meaning maybe only 90% of the PCBs manufactured will work due to defects. The same thing goes also for the small annular ring. So something like a 0.1 millimeter annular ring will again increase the cost and lower the yield. As a general purpose via, I can recommend these following sizes. So large will be a pad of 0.7 millimeters and a drill of 0.3, medium 0.6 and 0.25 drill, and a small via 0.5 and 0.2 millimeters. Now keep in mind, you might need larger vias and you might need smaller vias than this. Again, it depends completely on the scenario, but I get asked this question a lot. What vias sizes do you recommend? And as a general starting point, this seems about right. When we're talking about vias, we also need to think, as with traces, about the current handling capabilities. Traces can handle a certain amount of current before they heat up for a certain temperature rise, and vias are very similar. As a rule of thumb, a typical standard-sized via, basically regardless of size, one via can sustain about 1.5 amps for about a 20 degree temperature rise. As usual, I can highly recommend the Saturn PCB Design Toolkit, which is a free bit of software for your PCB design needs, so to speak. And if we go to VIA Properties tab, I can type in, for example, a VIA hole diameter 0.25 millimeters, and let's say a pad diameter of 0.7 millimeters. We can keep these VIA heights and VIA plating thicknesses about the same, and we're looking for a 20 degree temperature rise, and then we can click on Solve. And if we look at the bottom section here, VIA current, this VIA for 20 degree temperature rise can sustain two amps. So that's quite impressive given the small size of this VIA. Similarly, if we go down to 0.15 and a smaller pad, we can do about one and a half amps. And this is where my rule of thumb comes from that we can sustain about one and a half amps for general sized VIAs. If you of course require more than one and a half amps for high currents, for example, in ESCs, motor drivers and so on, we simply need to use parallel VIAs and we can use them of the same size in a way, we would widen the traces to have an increased current handling capability. With vias, we don't increase the size, we simply have them in parallel. And this also helps with reducing inductances, which we'll come to later. As with current handling capabilities, we can also use parallel vias for better thermal conductivity. For example, underneath this QFNIC, you will typically have an exposed pad, such as this, and I place a set of vias in there in parallel, so to speak, connecting to a ground plane, and this improves my thermal and electrical properties. Next, let's talk about placement. And in brief, I've summarized it like so. We always need to take into account, regardless of placement of traces, of components, of vias, and so on, we always need to think about clearances between these parts. So clearances between vias and vias, vias and traces, vias and pads, and so on. And this again is detailed by the minimum possible clearances from your PCB manufacturer. Again, I advise you to stay away from them. For example, if I'm routing out from a signal via here, I wouldn't place my track this close to these vias because this is first of all violating clearance constraints, this will be harder to manufacture, and I can also get cross coupling. If I place, for example, vias close to each other, these signals are more likely to couple into each other. Therefore, try and keep adequate spacing between vias, traces, and so on. Next, let's see how to place power and ground vias. And effectively, power and ground vias as opposed to signal vias, we want them close to the pad, but not in the pad, and wide traces. In addition, we want to place power and ground via pairs close together, as vias always come in pairs, and you want to place them close together to minimize the inductance of the pair. This is shown here with this decoupling capacitor going to the pad of this integrated circuit. I have my ground via with a short wide trace connecting to the via and to the pad, and very close to it, I've placed the five volt via. So I've minimized my spacing between these two vias within a reasonable distance. So it's 0.3 millimeters, which is far away from the manufacturing capabilities. But differential pairs, if we want to change layers, for example, we'll need differential pair vias. So essentially a set of two vias. We want these as close as possible again, within reasonable manufacturing limits. For example, I have this USB high-speed differential pair here. I want to maintain my 90 ohm impedance from the traces but I branch out slightly before going into these vias to give myself enough spacing between these vias as to not cause any manufacturing issues. However, when placing vias close together, we get a problem or an issue known as voiding. Essentially for through-hole vias, so vias that go through the whole PCB, placing vias close to each other can cause cuts in the reference plane. 
Here I have layer one of my board. If I look at layer two, which is my ground plane underneath, you can see every time I have a via that isn't connected to ground, I get this circular shape known as a void. Everything in this area will not be connected to ground and will be empty, so to speak. It'll be etched away. Now I've placed my vias so I don't get too large voids. I've always placed my vias far enough apart from each other so copper can flow essentially between these vias. If I place my vias closer and closer together, for example like so, first I'll get these small copper slivers, but even worse, I can create these voids and all the cuts in these ground planes. Now these vias are quite small, but you can imagine if I have very, a lot of vias placed closely together and larger sized vias, these will cause large cuts in the ground plane. And then on my signal layer, if I route a trace over the split, this can be very harmful. It's harmful for the return current paths because they'll have to flow around this split in the ground plane. And thus in turn, it'll be harmful for electromagnetic interference and signal integrity. We have more chance of crossing splits in the reference plane. We'll get increased field spread, which increases the radiation and EM signature and an impedance change if a trace is routed over a void because the reference below is missing. Therefore, the solution to this is quite simple. Space your vias further apart and keep checking your reference planes for larger cuts. Talking about references, let's move on to transfer vias. So let's say we have a signal plane on the top where we're routing traces. We have a dielectric material in between and on the other layer, we have a ground plane. For AC signals, so on the order of a couple of kilohertz, this return current is immediately and instantaneously in the reference plane, in this case, the ground plane below the signal trace. The fields between the forward path and the return path are shown by these arrows very crudely. And these fields are tightly coupled between the signal trace and the return plane. So this is fine if we're not going through any vias and we're just routing on traces. The question is what happens when we want to route from a signal plane down to a different signal plane with the help of a via. Transfer vias really help with that and are incredibly important for EMI and SI. Let's assume we have a signal trace running along on the layer one, we have a ground on layer two and another signal layer on layer three. If we're routing along on a trace and then we change layers with a signal via, we still have the same reference, but what happens during this transition along this via? The problem is we'll get real field spread as the return path and these fields try to find the nearest reference. We can help define a proper return path by placing a grounded via, so that connects to the ground plane, close to this signal via, as shown here. So the left is a signal via and the right is a ground via. And again, these blue arrows indicate the coupled fields. So in this way, during our z-axis transition, with this transfer via, we aid the return path and improve our EM signature. And this is the reason on my PCBs you will always find, if space allows, these transfer vias. For example, this signal via here has a ground via close to it and same as this signal via. It's usually okay for signal vias to share one of these transfer vias. And here are some more examples as well. So always a ground via as close as reasonable to a signal via. Lastly, let's have a look at stitching vias. Essentially, there's two reasons for stitching vias. Often in multi-layer PCB designs, we'll have multiple ground or power layers and multiple ground or power copper pores on a single PCB. For instance, this is a six layer board. I have my signal, ground, signal, power, ground, signal. Without stitching vias, layer two ground and layer five ground, as well as any other ground or copper pores wouldn't be very well connected together. We need to tie these together with vias, however, and I'll show you in just a bit how to do that, but we need to do that to reduce inductance. So we don't want any impedance between these ground planes. And we can do that by placing stitching vias around these planes. And additionally, every time we have copper islands, which are maybe, for example, are not attached at all or poorly attached with just a small number of vias, these copper islands can act as antennas, resonate, and then even radiate. And this can be really harmful for EMC. Therefore, you oftentimes see quite a few ground vias other than these transfer vias sprinkled around the board for exactly those reasons. The second reason or use for stitching vias is for shielding. Essentially, we can use this shielding wall to suppress energy of electromagnetic waves up to a certain frequency from entering or leaving a section of the PCB. In this way, we can better segment PCBs in the electromagnetic spectrum. We can also see we typically space them by a capital L, which is our stitching via spacing. An example of stitching vias might be to shield this analog section a bit better or stitching vias around this crystal oscillator. In both cases, so for tying together copper pores and for shielding, the spacing is determined by the maximum frequency apparent in a PCB. So for an audio PCB, that might be 20 kilohertz. 
And for an RF PCB, that could be 2.4 gigahertz, if not even higher. For analog PCBs and analog designs, that's pretty easy to find. However, for digital, the maximum frequencies are actually contained in the edges of the square waves, and we can get those via the rise and fall times of these square waves. If you're interested in learning more about how to extract rise and fall times and how we can calculate maximum frequencies, I strongly suggest watching video 64 on my channel titled PCB Design for EMI and SI. In any case, once you have your maximum frequency of concern on your PCB, we simply need to use this formula to calculate the spacing while stitching vias. This formula is essentially V equals lambda F, so the velocity is the wavelength times the frequency and that is rearranged. So if C is the speed of light, and if we divide that by the square root of epsilon, and epsilon is this, the dielectric constant, and this depends on if you're routing a microstrip, so an outer layer trace or a strip line, so an inner layer trace, and C divided by square root of epsilon gives us the speed of propagation of electromagnetic waves on our PCB. We divide this speed by the maximum frequency of interest, and that gives us our wavelength, and then our stitching spacing is essentially a 20th of that wavelength. So I've taken a microstrip trace, I've taken epsilon is about 3.3, speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, and my maximum frequency, let's just say and as an example, 2.4 gigahertz, which is a typical Wi-Fi RF frequency. I plug all these numbers in and then divide that result by 20, and that gives me a stitching via spacing of 3.4 millimeters. And the same thing I would do, not just for shielding, but also in an ideal case for tying my ground planes and my copper pores together. However, certain other rules can apply for tying together copper pores, which we won't be covering in this video. So thank you very much for watching this video. I hope it was useful and I hope it gave you a small and brief introduction to most important aspects of vias in PCB design. Of course, there's much more to this and I encourage you to read up more on this topic and I'm sure I'll make more videos in the future. Please make sure to subscribe to the channel for future videos and more PCB design content. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye-bye.